background on Eunice. She uh, was born in Ephraim, Wisconsin on the family farm. And she attended uh, Liberty Grove School and Gibraltar High School. Graduated from the National College of Education in Evanston, and I presume that's Illinois. Right. Taught school in Long Beach, California for four years, and one didn't study all the time because she met Ray, and Ray is quite a dasher. Huh? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they were married in Long Beach. They moved back to Door County in 1963, um, opened and taught the first kindergarten class in northern Door County, taught the first and second grade at Egg Harbor. And at this point, I have to ask, where was the school in Egg Harbor? Where the firehouse is. Where the firehouse is. Where the fire is. station is. Interesting. Oh, sure. Oh, see, I didn't know that either. I didn't know that Egg Harbor ever had a school. <laughs> This is um, Marilyn Duplain <clears throat> was teaching there when I was there, and there was a Mrs. Tank for a little bit, and Glenn Gerdman from Ephraim taught there, and I taught there um, for four years, and then they turned it over because the um, schools consolidated, and so then I moved from um, there to Sister Bay, and because we had two grades in a room at Egg Harbor. It was first and second grade, third and fourth and fifth and sixth. So then we went to one grade per teacher after my time at Egg Harbor. So then I moved to Sister Bay and was, was there. But yeah, that was a neat little school. I was down in the basement. The little mice would run across the way. <laughs> and it was fun. It was really a, a charming school. We had a good time there. Well, now I learned something. See, that's before my... And we had the most wonderful cook, Helen Miller. Helen Miller. Was the cook there. Brothers or and she, Miller? she fattened us up, but good. Because Egg Harbor School was the only school at that time that the others, um, when they consolidated, they wanted to keep their own hot lunch program. The other schools did not have a hot lunch program. But Egg Harbor stayed with their hot lunch program, so Helen cooked the meals. And she would come down, and we had hot homemade bread, and we'd have the most delicious meals. It was unbelievable. And she'd make coffee cake for our snack, for the teacher's snack. At, oh, it was terrible. Catherine Miller, and not Helen, Catherine. Yeah. Oh. Ah, yeah. They had, they just had fifth grade there for a while, fifth and sixth grade for a little bit, and then they closed it when they um, started closing all the little outlying schools. Yeah. That schools is another whole history lesson that I can, I've got volumes on the schools of Northern Door County. <laughs> <clears throat> well, anyway, she went to, she taught school in first and second grade in Aid Harbor, taught second grade in Sister Bay for 15 years, taught second grade in the Gibraltar uh, for 10 years, and then retired in 1995. Joined the Gibraltar Historic Society and had been very involved with the organization, was president for 12 years, as I mentioned, and is still on the board. Um, her husband, Ray, who is sitting right here, uh, they both live right in Fish Creek. They love Door County. I don't think they'll ever move out again. Come here to stay. Put your hands together and welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, this is my grandfather, Carl Seiler. My grandfather, Carl Seiler, immigrated from Germany to America in 1863, bringing his wife, Christiana, and two boys. We're quite sure there were two boys at that time. They settled on a piece of land on what is now County Q and Town Line Road. Carl applied for citizenship in 1868, and it was granted in 1870. 
they had to wait a while. This is, I have his old certificate. This is a copy of his naturalization papers. And uh, he had to give up all allegiance to Bim, king of, king of Hoft in Germany before he could become a citizen. So whatever that meant. But the, then the second, and this is his wife, Christiana. Her, in picture three, the next one. Where are you? I can't see him. There he is. Okay. The log cabin that they built, and the log cabin would be this part right here. Ooh, I made a mark on it. The log cabin they built was very small. One room with a loft for sleeping. It was later used, in, in my lifetime when I was living on the farm, it was used as the horse barn. In 1995, my sister, Alberta, had the two barns separated. There was the, ho the original uh, log cabin, which was the horse barn, and then they had built another log building, and that was used for the cow barn. But she had the two barns separated, and the cow barn was turned and made into a two-car garage, and she turned the horse barn back into a late 1800s log cabin, as they would have had it at the time. Just really very, very charming. <clears throat> the area from Town Line Road and north of Kew, south to near Bailey's Harbor, became known as the German settlement. There were a few Swedish people and a few Norwegians. Our neighbor was a Norwegian. But um, for the most part, all of the people in that area were pretty much the German, and it became known as the German settlement. Is that your dad in the second row on the right over here? Yeah, that's my father. Yeah. And I don't know why they have the Red Cross on their hats, the women. But this was taken in our neighbor's house. And I have at home, I have all the names of all the people. So I know who they all are, their neighbors and farmers. But yeah, that was neat. Carl and Christiana had two more children. Sadly, Christiana died shortly after Herman was born. And you can imagine, with four little children and a farm to care for, Carl quickly found second wife just down the road <laughs> and he married Wilhelmina Benz. They had 10 children, eight surviving to adulthood and my dad John was the ninth child of that second marriage. And then we can move on. Carl had built this part this lar the larger part, the tall part. He had built that once there were so many kids, um, they had to move out of that little log cabin. So he built this part of the house. And in 1860, 1886, the year my dad was born, the kitchen was added on. And the lower part was all kitchen, huge kitchen. We could have two sets of square dances in the kitchen. So it was big. Uh, <clears throat> Carl died in 1894. My dad was very, very young. He was about nine, going on 10 years of age at the time. He quit school. He had been going to school over where the Liberty, in the area where Liberty School is. The building is still standing. <clears throat> with the Liberty Grove School, there was a school called the Manassas School. It was also the Moravian Church, but there was a building there, and that's where they had school, and it was all German, all taught in German. And he quit school to help his mother run the farm. In 19, and you can imagine, 10 years of age, he was the only boy left at home, so it was his responsibility. In 1913, my dad, still a bachelor, bought the farm from his mother. And I have the old, the contract that he signed when he bought the farm. And to read it, I'm not going to read all of it, 
but it is really funny because he had to give, all, it was all handwritten. This is a copy, but it was all handwritten and all the things that he had to provide for her because he bought the farm, but she was going to be living still on the farm with him. So it was things like to be sure that she had enough wood, he had to put a building on to the side and part of the house, the back house that was to be hers. Of course, they never did follow all those rules because his mother was basically there and she took care of him too, you know, so that's the way that worked. But uh, it, it's really an interesting document to read. <laughs> We'll go on next. The time period I will be talking about is the 1930s and 40s, as I remember life on the farm. Of course, I was the youngest of six children, and I probably remember more of the fun than I do the work, but because uh, I think I got out of a lot of the work, <laughs> but it, it was a good time. Most farms operated about the same. Actually, usually they had 40 to 80 acres of land. They'd raise enough food to provide for their family and uh, take care of the animals. We had cows, we had chickens, pigs, horses, and sheep. Dad owned 80 acres of land, and except for a small wooded area, it was all worked as farmland. He also rented a field across the road from a Hans Nelson, and that was used as pasture land. He raised corn, wheat, rye, oats, and barley, and also peas. We grew a lot of peas. Don't know why, but we did. My brother chewed them constantly. My oldest brother, my mother would just have a storm when she did the laundry because there were always peas in his pocket. He had the most beautiful teeth when he passed away at 85. He had not any cavities in his mouth. He had beautiful teeth, but he chewed those hard peas all the time because he never smoked. So on the farm, he would chew those hard peas. I guess it was good. He seemed to like it anyway. Um, we never had a cherry orchard on our place, but many of our neighbors did have an orchard. We did, however, have a few pear trees. Since there was not a tractor, horses were used. Oh, this, by the way, is, if you go, can you go back? This was my family now, this, my sisters and brothers. My dad is sitting with the hat on, he always wore a hat, and my brothers and sisters. There were six of us in the family. I was the youngest. Uh, okay, the next, the next picture. My dad loved horses. He just loved horses, and we always had horses on, on the place. This was a picture that was taken by a man that was there in the summertime, most usually in the summertime, and he just lived down the road a little way, and he was a great photographer. He loved taking pictures. His name was Mr. DeMuth, and he wanted to take my dad's picture with this horse, and my dad got all dressed up because he thought this was really something special he was going to, and he wouldn't take his picture until he put on his old clothes and his old hat, because that's the way he recognized him and wanted him to be. <laughs> so life on a farm was hard work for everyone, really. There was no running water, no electricity or central heat, no indoor plumbing. Dad told of walking to Ephraim, which was about a little over a mile, and filling two buckets of water from the bay, then carrying it home using a yoke and carrying the two buckets of water home. There was a well, and of course I remember, and there still is the well there now, uh, there was a well and windmill, and that was probably put in in the late 1800s sometime, early 1900s. Spring, summer, and fall were the busiest time for farmers. In spring, several days were spent picking stones from the fields before planting. 
stones were picked up and put on a stone boat that the horses pulled along. It was flat with no wheels, no sides, and the reason it was made that way, it was easier to roll those large stones onto the stone boat and roll them off again. Stones would then be hauled to a fence line and unloaded. I think every farm in Door County had or has a stone fence line on their property somewhere. <clears throat> and I, I do believe that stones in Door County grow little ones. I think they do. If you've ever picked up stones on a farm, you, you know that they have little ones. Because <laughs> every spring there's more there. The next one. Once the fields were ready, it was time to plant. All the grain was seeded, then corn planted, which was done by hand. And I wished I had the corn planter that we used, but it was a hand corn planter. You'd put the corn in the little pocket thing and walk along, and jab it down, open it up, jab it down, open it up. And that's the way you'd plant several, many acres of corn. So it took a while. And of course, we planted potatoes, which was every household staple food for uh, the winter. Potatoes, too, were planted by hand. One person would dig a row of holes, and one of us kids would walk along behind and drop in a potato and make sure that the eyes were down so that they would grow properly and then cover it up again and keep walking along and plant an acre or two of potatoes. In the fall, each hill was dug up by hand, picked the potatoes off the vine, and put it in a crate to be hauled to the root cellar for winter storage. The next big job was haying. First it was cut, then raked, raked into windrows, and left to dry. Usually the rows were forked over to dry completely because many a hay barn burned because hay was put in the mow when it was still damp. So it was very necessary to be sure that hay was dry. Fire was every farmer's worst nightmare. And I can remember when I was little and a storm at night, my dad would make all of us get up. It didn't matter. I would, was scared of thunder and lightning until long after we were married. I just was frightened to death of thunder and lightning because he made it that way because you had to get up and he'd walk the floor and then he'd look to see that the barns were all right and oh my goodness you know by the time the storm was over you were so nervous you were ready to fly. <laughs> Once the hay was dry it was loaded onto a wagon which was driven into the hay barn floor. Oh, that's potato. There's the hay. Um, a large fork, which worked on a pulley system, grabbed a big fork full of hay, and then the horses would be driven out and was hitched to the pulley system in some way. And as they moved, horses moved forward, the fork of load of hay would go up and go into the hay mow and then be dropped and into the mow where it was uh, spread around evenly and, and taken care of. The smell of new mown hay was really very sweet. That was always a very special smell that, that um, I can remember any time, you know, when you go past a hay field. It's really wonderful. But the hay mow was also a great place to play, and it was also a great place for the Easter bunny to hide your Easter basket. Sometime near the end of July or first part of August, the grain was ready to be harvested. Oh, those beautiful golden fields. And then soon threshing time. Threshing was very hard work for everyone, but an exciting time for kids. I so loved the sound of that big old steam engine puffing down the lane to the farm. Once the grain was cut, it was raked into rows, then hand tied into bundles, hand tied into bundles, which were set up in a teepee style into what was called a shock. This was done to also dry the grain. <clears throat> the neighbors in the area formed a company and bought a threshing machine. In fact, it, this one, that, that one, go back, yeah, 
to the threshing machine. There, they bought this machine. There was, um, I don't know, maybe you people will, some of you will know some of these people. There was a Richard Staver, an Albert Smith, an Eric Miller, Oscar Smith, Herman Staver, and my dad were the owners of the, of the machine. They went from one farm to the next, always helping each other. It might be one or two days, sometimes even three, at each farm. Uncle Oscar was in charge of the steam engine. And when he blew that whistle, everyone knew it was time to get to work. As many as 15 to 18 men were needed to get the work done. The young guys, the 16 to 18 year old guys, like my two brothers and Marvin Staver and some of those, Harry Miller, Cy Siler, they were the grain carriers. A gunny sack was held under a chute and filled with the grain, <clears throat> and they would grab it, toss it over their shoulder, and walk up these steep steps to the granary, dump it out, come back down, do it all over again. And you do that for a couple of weeks, it could be very tiring. <laughs> uh, each bag weighed about 50 pounds. The straw was blown into stacks near the barn and was used for bedding for the animals. The guys would be so dirty and tired that after chores and milking, they would go down to the bay in Ephraim and do some skinny dipping at night because, of course, we didn't have a bathroom at home, so uh, it was good to go to the bay and get your bath. The next one. In September, the corn was ready. Now it's time for silo filling. First, though, all the corn needed to be picked from the stalks, by hand, of course. The cobs of corn were hauled to the hay barn floor to await the corn husking bee. The corn was cut and put into bundles. The same steam engine was used for silo filling as for threshing. The stalks were chopped up fine and blown into the silo, which was used for feed for the animals in winter. Not as many men were needed for this operation, but it took quite a few. And my dad was always in the silo. That was his job. The owner always did the work inside the silo, packing it straight, you know, spreading it out because of the danger that it was his place, so you, you had to go in there. You didn't trust that to anybody else. Corn husking bees were held in the evenings. This was as much a social event as work to be done. Lanterns were hung in the barn for light. Lots of talk and many stories. The young man who found a red ear of corn was allowed to kiss the young woman sitting closest to him. Some men cheated <laughs> by bringing a red ear of corn in their pocket. And not all gals were happy to be kissed. The husk corn was stored in the corn crib, which was a small building made of slats with lots of air spaces. Air flowing through kept the corn from getting moldy. The best part of husking bees was after all the corn was husked, a lunch was served. And if it wasn't too late, you'd push back the table, have a keg of beer in the corner, and do some dancing square dancing or whatever. The fall also meant time to butcher, probably a couple of pigs, a calf for veal, or a yearling for beef. Sausage was made, liver sausage, blood sausage, oh, regular beef sausage, and maybe some head cheese. My mother made something called rulipults, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a combination of pork and veal and beef that was rolled together with lots of spices, and then it was stored in a salt brine. And in the winter, then, after a couple of months being in the brine, she would bake it, often for Sunday night supper. And it was delicious, and I wish I had, because they didn't use any recipes, you know, it was just by feel and by 
oh, well, a handful of this and a handful of that. That's the way they cooked and baked. So there was never a recipe written down. So I don't know how she made it, and I've never been able to find a recipe because I would love to try it. Hams and bacon were taken to my Uncle Oscar's to be smoked, and the rest of the meat was either canned, but most often it was stored in a salt brine in large crocks in the cellar. Lots of fried salt pork during the winter months. The cellar had been dug out probably by hand when the house was built. <clears throat> it was just hard-packed earth, a very dark, cool place, ideal for food storage. The summer months were the bu busiest time. Beside all the field work, there was always the day, to, day chores that they had to do, milk the cows twice a day, clean the barns, feed the pigs and chickens, plus keeping up a large vegetable garden. Of course, that was usually my mother's job and the kids' job. On windless days, when the squeaky old windmill didn't turn, it was necessary to pump the water by hand. The water tank and the large tank um, overhead in the cow barn needed to be filled at all times. This was a task that even a very young kid could do and often had to do. One would think winter would be a little easier, but this was the time to go down to the North Bay woods and cut firewood, both for your own use, but also extra to sell for some cash. This picture shows some of the cordwood Dad sold, plus lots of fence posts. The next picture will show the fence posts, I think. Yeah, the fence posts. It was always good to make a little extra money. We sold cans of milk to a condensory, as did the other farmers. They would pick up the cans of milk each morning, and this was the basic income for most farmers. Eggs, <clears throat> eggs were traded for groceries at my Uncle Arnold Sohn's store in Ephraim. There were a couple of people who bought whole milk from us, too. I certainly remember, remember one particular gentleman. His name was Art Gorski. I can use his name because he's long gone. And he would come up to our house for milk. And I remember especially on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, and you all know what happened on that day. Oh, how that man ranted and raved about the United States going into war. He was he was actually scary. I was just frightened. I went in a room and was crying because I didn't know what was going to happen. And of course, my folks spoke, uh, speaking German and being German and everybody around there, of course, they were all quite afraid of what was going to happen to them. And uh, we were never taught German. As kids were never taught any German because uh, you were in America, you were supposed to speak English and they were really too afraid to have us speaking German at that time so I just never learned and that's been a sad part of my life I wish I had been able to learn and have some German uh, I think that about yeah covers it okay whenever farming is mentioned one thinks of the men and all the work they had to do but let's not forget the women who worked just as hard. Remember those 15 to 18 men that were at the farm for threshing? Well, they all had to be fed while working at your place, and not just one meal a day. Your own family for breakfast. Then at 10 o'clock, you served a lunch consisting of bread, cheese, sliced cold beef, maybe, or some pickles, some canned fruit, cake, coffee. Then they'd go back to work for a while. Then you had a complete dinner at noon. Meat, potatoes, vegetables, breads, dessert, the works. My mom always made lemon meringue pie because it was her specialty. None of the other women would ever make lemon meringue pie because Clara's was the best. And so they would make something else, but she made her lemon pie. Another lunch was served at 3 o'clock, and then supper for your own family. Remember, there was no running water, 
So you carried it in, heat it on the wood stove, and of course carry out the wastewater. Mom was lucky because she had four girls to help. At six or seven, you could certainly at least dry dishes. And uh, he had many of them to dry. The women were responsible for preserving the food in the fall. The cellar shelves were full in the fall. There was peaches, pears, cherries, raspberries, pickles of all different kinds, jams and jellies. There would be several hundred quarts of preserved fruit in the basement. I mean, there were three, four big long shelves in our in our uh, basement, and that would be all lined up with all the food, fr fruit, and things for the winter. And it was really very, very wonderful, very tasty, and good. I still do my own preserving and love it. Uh, after butchering, it was time to make soap. At least once a week, you churn butter. And of course, always there was the home baked bread. We also gathered beech nuts butternuts and black walnuts to use in the winter time. And it's, if they weren't quite ripe when we are ready to, to break, when we picked them up in the fall, you'd put them in the, up in the granary, lay them out on the wheat, and that would help to dry them. And then you, you could crack them later on. Monday was wash day, and it was a day's work, a full day's work. First, you hauled in the water, heated in the copper boiler on this wood stove, then wash in that temperamental old gas engine washing machine, put it through the hand wringer, then through two rinse waters, hang it on the clothesline, rain, shine, winter, summer, it didn't matter. In the winter, it would come in and it was stiff as a board and you'd, it was still wet. I don't know why they hung it outside. I've never figured that out. Never, never, never. I couldn't figure out why do you hang it out and you bring it in wet and then you hang it all over the house. Why not just hang it in the house? No, because it would, wouldn't smell right. So, and it all got hung on the clothesline to dry. Finally, you'd carry out the wastewater and we could see across the hill and across the field to our neighbor's house. And uh, there was Ella Knutson, Ella and Ed Knutson. And I can still hear my mom saying, oh my, she has her wash out already. You know, oh my goodness. And so you were a slacker if you were kind of late, you know. And women were judged by their housekeeping skills by how white their laundry was. I mean, if you didn't have really nice white laundry, you were not the best housekeeper in the world. So. It was kind of fun to think about that. Tuesday was ironing day. Now all that nice dry clothes is sprinkled, rolled up, put in a basket, and the day spent ironing. The irons were heated on the wood stove. The heat lasted for about 10 minutes on an iron. And I learned to iron by doing the hankies and pillowcases. That was my job to do as a little kid. And you know, I still love to iron, and I iron all the time. I love to iron. Isn't that crazy? You'd think I would hate it, but I love to iron. Wednesday was finish the ironing if you needed to, and then mend any clothes that needed to be mended. Nothing was thrown away if it could be mended and you could get some more use from it. There were always socks to darn. I think I, my mother had a basket of socks with three guys in the house, you know, there was a basket of socks sitting there all the time that needed some mending. Thursday was time to churn butter, and Friday was cleaning day. The house was cleaned from top to bottom. You'd scrub that, remember that big kitchen floor? That was all maple flooring, and it was scrubbed white. It was just white, and it was to the day when we sold the house in 1995, that floor was still a maple flooring. It was just as white as could be in that house. You'd scrub that big kitchen floor on your hands and knees till it was really scrubbed white. Saturday was baking day, and oh boy, could my mom bake. She made the most delicious schnecken, which is a sweet roll with raisins and cinnamon in it. Oh, they were good. Uh, 
just lots of good things. She was a very, very fine baker. She did a lot of baking at many of the hotels in, in Ephraim, a couple of the hotels actually in Ephraim during the time when she, I don't know how she found time, but she did, you know, that she would go to work and I can remember her coming home and setting bread at night and setting the alarm. She would go to bed and she'd set the alarm for a couple of hours while the bread was raising. She'd get up, punch it down, set the alarm again, go back to bed, get up, you know, take care of, put it in tins, go back to bed, then get up and put, we'd have warm bread for breakfast. I don't know, I, I wonder how they did it all, but they did for some, somehow they got through it. Sunday was meant Sunday school and church. And other than that, the normal daily chores, you really didn't do anything. That was a day of rest. And you really did not, unless it was just the most extreme emergency, you did not work on Sunday. Everything was closed. I mean, you couldn't go to the grocery store or anything. They were, they were all closed. Everybody closed and stayed home and rested because that was the day of rest. Everything I've talked about seems like it was just work, work, and more work. But there were many, many fun times, too. Neighbors were very important. And they would often drop by for an evening visit. No special invitations were ever given. I can't remember, you know, you didn't have a telephone, of course, so I can't remember, you know, saying, oh, come over. It was just, oh, you'd look out and there would, they would be, you know, your neighbors would be there and they'd come in and visit for an evening. Yeah, or the minister. <laughs> and then you ran like crazy. You knew you would be welcome no matter when you dropped in. Dad grew his own popcorn and it was the best popcorn. It was so good. And so a snack when company came was usually popcorn and a bowl of apples and a conversation. And that's how you spent your evening. Dad also made wonderful popcorn balls and delicious pulled taffy. He made the best taffy. So life was very simple. Since dad was from a large family and many of his sisters and brothers lived close by, Sunday afternoon was usually a good time for a visit. And since ours was the home place, guessed it, most of the people came to our place. And so it would be Sunday night supper. And somehow or another, you know, there would be a, a feast on the table all of a sudden and, and you'd go down to the basement and there was always fruit or something to get up and, and uh, they could put a meal together, nothing flat. It just was amazing to me. Um, school and church were important. School was important. We had a lot of programs at school and that was kind of basically uh, your entertainment was church and school and home, and you made your own entertainment. That's about what you did. Uh, the women had ladies' aid meetings, in which was an all-afternoon event, and uh, they would usually, at least once or twice a month, they would get together and, and uh, from the Ephraim Arabian Church, and, and they would have a good time. There were always school programs, and I'm sure that Egg Harbor had the same kind of programs at Christmas time and Valentine Day. They would always have school programs, and uh, Liberty Grove had the same. Women kept busy with knitting, crocheting, embroidery, quilting. They always seemed to have something to do. They always had something in their hands. They were always busy. I don't remember really my mother ever just sitting down and just sitting because there was always socks to mend or she loved to crochet and you know they would take a bed sheet and make the most you do the crocheting on the edges of the bed sheets and they were so beautiful you I've got a couple of them I don't want to use them of course I don't want to use them because you'd have to iron them I mean they're just that old cotton stuff you know and, and you had to iron it and iron it but uh, they just tried to make things pretty and and to have a few um, nice things in their home 
I remember too many Saturday night dances in our kitchen. The ta as I said, the table and chairs were pushed to the wall and a keg of beer in the corner and everyone brought some food, which was served around midnight. We had uh, Elmer and Josephine Lang who lived down the road. They used to have a hotel in Ephraim. They're both gone now, but um, Elmer would play the fiddle and Josephine played the accordion and a little cornmeal sprinkled on the kitchen floor, made it nice and slippery, and you could do a lot of dancing. Often there were two sets of square dances that could work on our kitchen because it was so large, and since ours was seemed to be the largest room for most, most people would have their, um, would come to our house for the dances because we had the, this big kitchen, so, it, it really was, there was a lot of fun and there were a lot of good times. And of course a wedding was usually a three day affair. Oftentimes, two, three days for a wedding that they'd celebrate. I remember my dad telling about um, my one cousin who was married and they had the reception or whatever at our place because their place was a little smaller. and. Uh, he said it went on for three days. People would go home and do their chores and come back again. So I don't know, that must have been quite a time. Uh, yeah, I want to just do this quickly if I can find this. Where? Yeah. Is that your farmhouse up there? Yeah, that's our house. I don't know if there are any more pictures on there or not. I th think that was the last one. Now just for a brief minute, just excuse me for one little minute. I'm gonna wear an apron. You were slovenly if you didn't wear an apron. Take my word for it. I'd like to read just a little poem. The principal use of grandma's apron was to protect the dress underneath. Because she only had a few, it was easier to wash aprons than dresses, and they used less material. But along with that, it served as a pot holder for removing hot pans from the oven. It was wonderful for drying children's tears, and on occasion was even used for cleaning out dirty ears. From the chicken coop, the apron was used for carrying eggs, fuzzy chicks, and sometimes half-hatched eggs to be finished in the warming oven. When company came, those aprons were ideal hiding places for shy kids. You could get under there really nice. And when the weather was cold, Grandma wrapped it around her arms. Those big old aprons wiped many a perspiring bow bent over the hot wood stove. Chips and kindling wood were brought into the kitchen in that apron. From the garden, it carried all sorts of vegetables. After the peas had been shelled, it carried out the shells, or the hulls. In the fall, the apron was used to bring the apples that had fallen from the tree. When unexpected company drove up the road, it was surprising how much furniture that old apron could dust in a matter of minutes. <laughs> When dinner was ready, Grandma walked out onto the porch, would wave her apron, and that was a signal. The men knew, knew it was time to come in for dinner. Be a long time before someone invents something that will replace that old time apron that served so many purposes. Thank you. If you have any questions, anything at all? Any uh, questions or comments for Eunice? Yeah. Um, now, you were uh, mainly talking about the German settlement. So are you saying that, I mean, we have read before that the German settlement didn't do a whole lot with the Ephraim mites? Do I want to say because they're mainly... It was quite religion. a bone of contention. So was there? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. And then what church did you go to? Did you go to I the went, one next to the Moravian church? No, the, we, we did go to the Ephraim Moravian. 
Um, but we were always the country folk. And that was, there was a definite line and a definite feeling there. Uh, and my dad often talked about it because he, you know, you were never really invited into the inner circle, so to speak, because you were, you were the farm people and we were the, the country people and they were the town people. And I think that went on. I even noticed it still in high school at Gibraltar. There was a definite feeling. Of course, I graduated in 49, so, uh, you know, it was a while ago. But there was a definite feeling about the country kids and the town kids. And there, there really was quite a line that was, was drawn in, in that re regard. And it was kind of hurtful sometimes. But my, my family, my dad's family, as I said, went to the Manassas German school. And that was over on Highway 57, and um, where the Liberty Grove School is now, that old Liberty Grove School, it's not a school any longer, but somebody lives in there. But um, there was another building on that piece of property up a little bit further, and that was the original school, and then it was also the church. And so when Reverend Iverson was in Ephraim, um, and started the Moravian Church, why he would sometimes walk over to uh, that area and give have church services. So I suppose it was only natural that my dad then, uh, you know, went to the Ephraim Moravian Church because he was kind of involved with the Moravians at that time. So I think that's probably why we did all go to the Ephraim Moravian Church. But, uh, and most of the people in the country did go. But I know even in ladies' aid, when they would, they would have all these women and they would have what they called fruit basket upset about every two years when they had about four different circles that they called circles, groups, and they would mix, want to mix them up. And, oh, there would be huffing and puffing and storming around because, you know, the town people didn't want to be with the country people. And so it finally just, they decided to leave it alone. Okay, let the country people meet and let the town people meet, you know, because yeah, that, that did go on. It's surprising. It's surprising. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. If you had a small woods on a farm, where did all the logs come from? My dad owned um, about 40 acres down in North Bay and he, that's where he got all the logs. So they would go down down there. It was quite a, quite a drive down there. They'd take a team of horses and in the cold winter and they'd go all day, they'd be down in the woods all day and then bring that stuff back. So I can remember my brother, Austin, who was um, the oldest one in the family, and he had a big black bear coat, full length coat. And that's what he would wear driving the team down there because just to stay warm. Because we thought we had a cold winter this winter. That was nothing compared to what we used to have. I mean, there was 20 below for days on end a lot of times, you know, that you would have. And uh, so it, it got to be kind of a cold time. But uh, yeah, they would, they would go down there and then bring it back. Any accidents on the farms? Um, not, not too many. The one awful accident that I remember, I don't remember it, but I know about it, I guess. Um, my uncle Oscar, when he was running the uh, steam engine, the threshing machine, he went to poke something down and he got his hand caught and he lost most of his fingers. And I can remember, even in his later years, I'd go, down to see him and uh, he, he, that always bothered me to see you know and he lost one thumb and that he didn't care about the fingers but the thumb that really bothered him that he lost the thumb because then he really lost use of that hand because he was a carpenter and too and so uh, that bothered him but that's about the only accident you know my dad lost a finger in the in the uh, pump trying to get the pump 
unfrozen one time, you know, pouring hot water over it and in the morning and trying to get it to go, and he lost a finger. And, but old Doc Schneeberger sewed it back on, and it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. How come I was smart enough and lucky enough to find you? <laughs> I've been looking for you. <laughs> we met in California. Oh, and how did you get to California? <laughs> How did I get to California? You, you left the county uh -huh. for school? I was, attended National College of Education in Evanston, Illinois, and which was really quite something for that time, too. Um, but I had a lot of wonderful people that were behind me and helping me, and uh, so I was able to, to go to college. And at that time, it was a lot of money, but can you believe? $600 a year for tuition at a college. Wouldn't you like that today for your kids? Uh, but um, then the administrator from Long Beach, California came out to National because this was a, a school of 400 girls all training for, te for teaching. And of course, teachers were just, you know, they were trying to get teachers all the time at that that point, and especially in California because it was growing so. So he came out to the college and interviewed all of us. And there were 17 of us from my class of 100 that went out to Long Beach together. <laughs> so 17 girls t went west. <laughs> and we all found husbands, I think, out there. <laughs> and then I lived there, I taught there for a few years, and then met Ray and, and we had two children while we were there, and uh, then we decided in 63, we came home at Christmas time to visit my dad, and I stayed here with the two children, and he went back, because he had to get back to the business, and, and I stayed for a month, and then went back, and he greets me with, what would you think of selling the house and the store, and we'd move back there? Uh? I mean, it had been so cold. It was one of those cold, horrible winters. And I thought, oh my gosh. But we did it. In the spring, we sold the business and sold our house and moved back here with no job in sight, or nothing, you know, and two kids. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we just took our chances. So, but it was my home. And we knew we had to do some different things there because we had a very small home and we had two kids and a boy and a girl and they needed to be, you know, a little separated. And, and uh, so we knew we had to do something. So that just seemed to be the best thing to do. So, yes. I have a question. Um, so when did your, when did your um, home receive electricity and plumbing? Let's see, I could figure out the year, but I know we had electricity in 19... We got electricity on my sister, Eleanor, and she's 10 years older than I am, uh, five years older than I am. We got electricity on her 16th birthday. And my mother was still living at the time, and I can remember her going around the house and switching the switches, and just it was just magical, you know. That, but we did not have running water in our bathroom in the house until 1964. Yeah, so it was quite a long time. So, yes. Okay. Tell me about the country doctor. Did you have a doctor? That Dr. Schneeberger. Oh, and you did have a doctor? Oh, sure. Dr. Schneeberger delivered all of us, except my old, the oldest one, Austin. My mother thought she had to go to Sturgeon Bay to the hospital. And she was so unhappy there that she said never again. So she had all the rest of them she had at home. And Doc Schneeberger would come to the house and have a midwife. Yeah, our neighbor would come over as the midwife. But old Doc Schneeberger, he, oh, he was a wonderful doctor. He really was. And you know, I have another connection to Egg Harbor that I should tell you about. In 1995, my sister was very ill. She was the one that was living on the farm at the time. And she wanted to have a family reunion. So we planned the family reunion and we had 
a huge family reunion. And I did some research into the family and looking up old records and everything. And I came across a name, a sister of my dad's. I had never heard him mention. I had never heard the name Martha in our house. And there was a Martha. And I dig further. Well, she married Edwin Fisher from Egg Harbor. And she's buried in the little cemetery over here. I, ne I don't know. And when my dad bought the, bought the farm from his mother, she died very early. She was 24 years old when she died. And Dr. What was the doctor's name in Egg Harbor? Ames. Ames, Ames yeah. He signed the document for Edwin Fisher to sign off on the farm that my dad had bought it so that he, you know none of the sisters and brothers could come back and say they wanted a part of it. So, but Dr. Ames signed for Edwin Fisher. I don't know what that was all about. But I never heard my dad talking about Martha. I, but there was a Martha. <laughs> so that's, that's another, another uh, connection to Egg Harbor. <laughs> yes? Do you know where Edwin Fisher, what, what he did? Was he a well driller? I don't know. I have no clue. I have found no information. I've been trying to ask, uh, have other cousins and stuff. You know, all those, they're all gone now. In Egg Harbor, though. Pardon? In 67, you were in Egg Harbor, right? 1967? We came back here in 63. And yeah, it, but I just looked yeah. you up today because yeah. <laughs> um, you were so helpful to me when I was uh, researching the schools. The Egg Harbor Schools for okay. the book. Yeah. And I called you many times, and I'm glad to meet you tonight. <laughs> I'm Judy Dexheimer. Okay. And um, Freeman Fisher lived where Christine's is. Yeah. So I... We, we, I don't know if that was any connection or not. Okay. I have no idea. Because we had no... We don't remember the Edwin, right? Well, that was the father's name. Yeah, Ed. Oh. But I don't know if it was Edwin. Mm. And this, this is signed Edwin. <clears throat> I have no Ed, clue. Edwin did drill well. He did. Okay. I'd really like to, to learn more. I mean, it's, it's fun to dig into all of that. What's your sister's name? My uh, sister. Your father's sister? Uh, what was it? Her name? Her name was Martha. Oh. Yeah. Because I'm got a lot of relatives around, you know, because big family like that with 13 kids and most of them stayed right around in the area. One brother went to Canada. He never married, and that's about the farthest. And then one sister married someone in New Franken near Green Bay. And, uh, but I did know her pretty well. And then there was another sister that went to, um, uh, Waukegan, Illinois, and she was married and lived there. But she always came back in the summertime. They had a summer home up here, so they came back here. But there were a lot of, lot of um, hardships. My one brother, if you can imagine, was um, born with a hair lip and cleft palate, and that was, you know, about 90 years ago, and almost 90, and he was... It was really terrible. They didn't think he was going to live. My dad took him down on a bus and on the train to Waukegan to his sister. And then they went to Evanston Hospital. And he had surgery on this little baby. And my dad took him all alone because my mother was home with the other kids and she had just given birth to this. He took that baby, and it had to be, he had to be fed with an eyedropper every few minutes. That's all he could do. And, uh, but they did surgery on him, and beautiful job. You could hardly tell, you know, that, that uh, he'd had that. God, I just came across, of all the funny things, I was looking through a bunch of papers today, and I came across the payment, $200 for the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> from a Dr. Potts in Evanston. Yeah. 
You might think I keep everything. I do. I do. I really do. I keep everything. <laughs> yes? Was there ever a name for the, uh, it looks like a little settlement on uh, 57 in Q, where, where the German Lutheran Church is, and there was a gas station there at one time. And oh, on that corner? Yeah, now it's kind of all built up. There was uh, the antique place, and then a few yeah. buildings down. That was my Uncle Oscar Smith's place <laughs> in Aunt Melia. They, it, it, Tannenbaum used to be in that building. Northeast corner. Uh, yeah, and that's where they lived. But um, it was just part of the German settlement, really. I don't think it had any special, yeah. Anything else? I could talk forever, so you know. <laughs> I certainly enjoyed it. This was fun. Okay.